how are you doing today, sir? Good, man. How you doing? I am. I'm well. I'm very impressed by your uh, physical media collection back there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you should have seen my VHS collection back in the day. <laughs> uh, well, let me. I don't have much time, so let me just go ahead and jump into it. Uh, I really absolutely loved this. Uh, I think this is uh, by far your best film to date. Oh, uh, I think this movie is very inventive and uh, just very ambitious. And one of the first things that, uh, so like in preparation for this movie, I went back and uh, rewatched obviously First Terrifier and had also uh, also checked out How All Hallows Eve, which I hadn't seen before. Okay. Uh, so like one of the things that I really find interesting about your work is uh, particularly uh, the gags that you have in your films. Um, I feel like we are in this kind of weird uh, renaissance of like slashers from the 80s coming back, whether you're talking about Leatherface or uh, Michael Myers and now Pinhead. Uh, Arthur the Clown stands as kind of like one of the only, of, if not the only original uh, slasher icon of the 21st century. Uh, can you kind of talk about the process for how you come up with the kills in the movies and like how to kind of consistently reinvent them? Oh, yeah. Um, well, for the first movie, um, I knew that we had to include some sort of show stopping kill because, you know, now people know what Terrifier is and, you know, Art the Clown's getting becoming popular. But at the time, he really wasn't at all. We just had All Hallows Eve and he had like a little tiny fan base growing. But I said, this is our chance to really sort of get in there. We have to swing for the fences with this character and we really have to show people what he's about. And we only had like $35,000 to make that movie. And I said, why are people going to come and watch this movie when they can watch a $20 million Hollywood horror movie? I said, we have to show things in this movie that they would never show. They would never have the balls to show. So I was looking up medieval torture methods and I came across this method of hanging people upside down and cutting them in half with a giant saw. And I said, this is, that is the most disturbing, grotesque thing I've, I've ever seen. And I've never seen that in a, in a movie before. I said, if we could pull that off and have Art do that to one of his victims, I think that would get people talking because this movie is all going to be based on word of mouth. I, I, just, I, I just knew we weren't gonna have anything behind it, pushing it. Um, and that's what we did. And when we went in, you know, everybody who read the script said, wow, that's the scene. How are you gonna do that? Are you really gonna show all that stuff? I mean, when Dave read the script, he thought I was just writing that description in the script just, to, just for the reader. He's like, but you're not gonna show all that stuff, right? I said, no, 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 I'm gonna show like every bit of that kill scene. And, uh, you know, we went in and, and we did it. And that's when people talk about Terrifier, they talk about art and they talk about that hacksaw scene. So you really got to um, you really got to do some show stopping things in order to grab people's attention these days, because there's a lot of there's a lot of competition out there. Yeah, and you guys are definitely standing out amongst them, especially with uh, this current slate of October just seems like a juggernaut month with how yeah. the end coming up next month again who just dropped uh hellraiser the day that we're interviewing this and then you also have uh art the clown coming back to uh terrify it and uh one of the things that i feel like uh you do really well in this one is that it expands the world and the lore of uh the first one where you look at the first terrifier it's a really simple really straightforward uh, story that you're telling and narrative but it's essentially a one location film whereas this one you are getting down in, in deep and talking with the uh you know really expanding the lore with this what were some of the challenges as you were writing and kind of like expanding this world the, well i say man oddly enough my my safety net the thing i was least concerned about making this movie was art the clown and the kill scenes um, Cause I feel very secure writing that character. I knew we'd deliver the goods on some level with the special effects. Although I was a little nervous about how are we gonna rival the hacksaw scene. Um, but the biggest risk I took 
was developing this sort of family dynamic, this family drama that's injected in this movie that's very absent from Terrifier 1, as well as the supernatural um, element that has, you know, only comes in at the tail end of Terrifier 1 for, for like a couple of minutes, but that's a very grounded movie. Um, so those were, those were the risks. Really, my, my biggest concern was crafting, especially Sienna's character, it's Sienna and Jonathan in this movie, the two protagonists, and hoping that the audience would sympathize with them and get behind them and follow them on this journey and really care about them when we throw them into, you know, like the literal pits of hell at the end of this, at the end of this movie. Um, so those, those were the concerns. And I mean, it, it's like you said, like it's a, this, this seems like a gamble to kind of take such a, a big jump in the expansion yeah. of the world. And uh, one of the things that I we talked about in my review for this, what this movie was uh, the fact that of how this movie uses grief and uh, kind of how the different people respond to it differently. Um, so in the in the core of this story, like you said, there's a family dynamic. We have uh, Sienna and Jonathan, who are brother and sister, who just recently lost their um, father. And uh, Sienna's response to to that grief is to kind of bring this character to life that her father drew for it. And then uh, uh, Jonathan's response is to kind of jump into like a art the clown true obsession. Yeah. Um, and our publication is unique because we focus on the mental health aspect of film in particular. Uh, is there any like autobiographical or uh, nature into like the development of these characters and kind of how they responded differently to the grief? Oh, sure. There's no doubt. This was the most vulnerable I, I've ever been as a writer. Um, that whole family, though, the whole trifecta, I, I, you know, not to a T, but I borrowed very, many elements from from reality. I mean, Sienna, um, Sienna is based on my two older sisters, a lot of their personality, their traits, um, even a little bit of me just being the artist. And Jonathan's very much based on me. That's how I was as a kid. I mean, I, you know, obsessed with horror, obsessed with death and serial killers, you know, I still am fascinated with, you know, mortality and things like that. It's just, it's just profound shit. And even the, the mother, uh, Barbara is very much, you know, based like 70% on, on my mother. So, you know, you have to, you have to write what you know. And I think the more, the more genuine and the more vulnerable you are with your characters, I think the audience will relate to them more uh, because they, they can sense that authenticity and then maybe it will be more powerful, you know, when you are getting toward the climax and you've been spending all this time with these people and you feel like you can relate to them. So it was important, it was really important to draw from real life with this film. I think that vulnerability aspect definitely plays off in this movie because I... Not to say that like I don't cheer at other horror films, but I found myself like really rooting for uh, in the in the climax of this movie. Oh, thank I you. think that is something that pays off really well and really effectively to have those those character journeys and kind of character arcs and uh, see how well rounded these characters feel too. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, look, I mean, we 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 said it going in. Um... You know, this could have been a, we could have phoned in a sequel easily. And instead of Art the Clown being in a, a warehouse this time, he's in a supermarket and he's just killing another group of uh, people, you know, something like that. And that, that is not what I wanted to do. I wanted to take this opportunity to, to grow the world, grow the mythology, grow as a filmmaker, tell a way more interesting uh, story and do something so original like when people see the runtime it freaks them out and they say oh my god like it because they think they're just going to get terrifier one you know expanded to two hours and 20 minutes but never did i get to the computer and say okay i'm going to make this two hour and 20 minute movie like i wanted to just tell this genuine organic story about these characters that wind up getting woven into art the clown's nightmare and this was just, the, you know, I wasn't trying to write filler and say, all right, I need to fill in a gap to get from this kill to this kill. I mean, there was a, it was pretty easy and very organic for me to write this story. I, I just knew the trajectory that this whole story had to go on. So, you know, again, it's not two hours and 20 minutes of filler. This is like a, just a genuine solid story with some really, really good arcs and, and things with these characters. Yeah. yeah, I was really surprised by how connected to the characters I felt. Um, I feel like it's, 
if the, the, your audience can create a emotional connection, it has a much more genuine uh, rewatch value or like it definitely has that, as you talked about with the first one, having that word of mouth value. And uh, like one of the things that I, and this is a weird question to, to ask, but uh, for those that have seen Terrifier 1, uh, we know that the prologue of that movie is uh, a journalist interviewing someone that was the survivor of this of the events of the first film. Can you kind of talk about how uh, the, the use of time plays into uh, from the events of Terrifier 1 to Terrifier 2? Because uh, there are like offhanded like conversations that happen in this movie that are like referencing uh, the first film and kind of where does this film kind of land in the overarching like storyline of this universe? Yeah, so I mean, it starts um, exactly where the last one left off, right? And then in the morgue with art being resurrected, and then it jumps forward a year uh, into the future, the next to Halloween. And that's what confuses people about part one. I mean, all the stuff with Victoria being interviewed is a year later. So when, when you see Art the Clown at the beginning of Terrifier 1 watching that, he's actually already killed himself and he's already back from the dead. And it's the year later he's about to go out. So in Terrifier 2, you actually see him in that same situation. But this time, the, the imaginary little pale girl is there who's actually the one operating the TV and stuff. But we didn't know about that character yet. You wouldn't see her in Terrifier 1. So all that stuff happens a year later. If that uh, if that helps, <laughs> it, it does. I I really like I really love uh, the fact that Art has kind of like that sidekick in here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where did that idea kind of originate from? So I knew that um, I was really going to explore this supernatural element, and I wanted it to be uh, an actual physical embodiment at some point. I wanted an apparition to represent this evil that's uh, guiding art that's driving him on his mission basically leading him towards sienna and jonathan um and i was thinking of well what could that be and i there's a movie that i love it's called um spirits of the dead it's a it's an edgar Allan poe anthology movie from could be the late 60s if not early 70s and one of the episodes is directed by uh fellini and uh, it's called Toby Dammit, based on uh, Edgar Allan Poe's short story. And there's a represent, uh, representation of the devil in it, played by this little girl. And she's really creepy. She's got like red hair, a white dress, like this pale face. And she's silent. And she just shows up every once in a while. And I always loved that and thought it was so creepy. So I wanted to do something like that. And originally, she wasn't going to be dressed as a mini Art the Clown. Originally, I was going to put her in this sort of yellow dress from the 60s with flowers on it. I mean, she was going to still look demonic with the eyes and the teeth and everything, but she wasn't going to be like that. And then I think it was the Halloween before we started shooting where I was getting tagged in all these Instagram posts of people dressing like art on Halloween and like 50 girls doing their own variation, their own version of a female art, the clown. And immediately I said, oh my God, I like we have to jump on that before it's too late. I mean, it's, it's too good. So I want to take my crack at my own uh, female Art the Clown and it, it just worked so perfectly. So, but I knew I wanted this creepy little girl representing this evil, this demon, this satanic force, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. But yeah. Was, but also if I could say, I didn't want her to overshadow Art the Clown in any way. And I didn't want her to be his sidekick through the entire movie. So, you know, I didn't want her to detract from him. So she, she shows up just enough um, to, keep it, to keep it interesting and to, to drive him forward and almost be like his cheerleader and his guide through this movie. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Uh, I think that she's well used and like very sparingly. So, uh, but Damien, I thank you for your time, man. Uh, so yeah, again, well done with this, this movie. It's uh, definitely one of the best horror movies of this year. Oh, thank you, buddy. That means a lot. Seriously, thank you so much. All right. Well, you have a great day, sir. Uh, you too, buddy. Take care.